All right, students, let's talk about the reaction types and driving forces of various reactions. This is a good time to get out your science notebook. Let's get started. At the top of your page, let's write down the essential question. How do we classify a reaction and know if it will happen? This is the guiding question for these notes that you should be able to answer by the end. Quite simply, these are the five different classifications of reactions. They are not in any particular order, but the first type is composition or synthesis reactions. Then there's decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, and combustion. Now we're going to go through examples of each of these, and you'll be able to see how we classify these reactions based on how the elements are being formed and rearranged inside the entire equation. Now one thing to note is if you look on the periodic table that's given to you in class, you're going to see this on that periodic table, the reaction types. You don't need to memorize these different classifications and how they form. All you need to be able to do is use this resource to be able to classify those reactions. So please remember that. You're not trying, we're not making you memorize that. Please use these resources. So we're going to go through each of these step by step so you can recognize them a lot easier. And that's the main idea. If given a chemical reaction or after you write a chemical reaction, can you recognize which reaction type you're looking at. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's start with a, a composition, not a combustion, a composition or a synthesis reaction. This is where two reactants combine to form one product. Now I've kind of underlined one of the key indicators of the reaction that we're looking at. So notice we have two things combining to form one. Here's an example of that. Here we have iron and oxygen and they form iron oxide. So two elements forming one compound. Now it could be two compounds forming one compound as well. Here's calcium oxide and water forming calcium hydroxide. Again, two substances coming together to form one product. All right, the opposite of a synthesis reaction is called a decomposition reaction. One reactant breaks apart to form two products. Now again, I kind of emphasize the term one reactant. That's kind of a key indicator to let you know a decomposition reaction is taking place. So here we have potassium carbonate, Then there's nothing it's reacting with. So the only thing it can really do is break apart into multiple pieces. So potassium carbonate breaks apart into potassium oxide and carbon dioxide. You can say, things, say the same thing about mercury two oxide. So mercury to oxide breaks apart into mercury, mercury and oxygen. All right, next is single replacement reaction. This is where we have a compound and a single element, and that single element replaces a similarly charged element in that compound. I like to think of this kind of like a dance. Here we have a couple dancing, and then over here we have just a single person or element, and that element wants to dance. So it's gonna go and ask one of the two other elements if it can butt in and dance. And depending on its charge, depends on which element it's gonna go ask. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here we have aluminum and iron two nitrate. In this case, we have our single element and a compound. Now aluminum wants to go and dance nitrate because nitrate's oppositely charged of it, and then iron's gonna go off and be alone. Similarly, here we have sodium or we have sodium iodide and fluorine, which is a diatomic element. Here, fluorine is our single element and it wants to go dance. So fluorine is going to go ask sodium because sodium's oppositely charged of it, and then iodine is going to go off by itself. That's a single replacement reaction. Next is double replacement reaction. This is where we have two compounds. This is very similar to a single replacement reaction, but this time we have two dance partnerships. Here we have partners AB and here we have partners CD. And what they're gonna do is they're just gonna change up friends. They're gonna change up partners. And A is gonna go dance with D and C is gonna go dance with B, always sticking to opposite charge. So here, here's lead to nitrate and potassium iodine. Lead is gonna go dance with potassium and uh, lead is going to go dance with iodine, I'm sorry, and potassium is going to go dance with nitrate. Same thing, iron to sulfide and hydrochloric acid both do a double replacement reaction, each switching their elemental partners. All right, the last type of reaction is called a combustion reaction. 
Here it's pretty straightforward. We have a hydrocarbon fuel that combines with oxygen gas to create carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water are kind of in key indicators that let us know that a combustion reaction is taking place. Now a hydrocarbon fuel is typically between hydrogen and carbon stuck together. This could be like methane in this first example here. It's reacting with oxygen to create carbon dioxide and water. The next one is, a, is isopropyl alcohol. You can light isopropyl alcohol on fire with the presence of oxygen in the air, and it will also create carbon dioxide and water. All right, let's just do a practice being able to classify these reactions. So let's say we wrote these reactions and we want to be able to classify them. The first one is a decomposition reaction. Notice we're starting with one reactant. That's all we have, and it creates two products. The second is a single replacement reaction. Notice we have our single element and then a compound, and that element replaces one of the elements in that compound. The third one is a composition, or also called a synthesis reaction, where we have two things combining together to make one. The fourth one is a double replacement reaction. We have two partnerships. Sodium goes with chlorine, hydrogen goes with hydroxide to create water, and that's a double replacement reaction. And then the last one, is a combustion reaction. We have some type of a hydrocarbon fuel and oxygen, and we create carbon dioxide and water. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about is the driving forces of reactions. Now, what is a driving force? The driving force is really the motive for a reaction to occur. Or in other words, compounds will only react if at least one of these driving forces are present, and they won't react if you don't see any of these driving forces. Now, what are the driving forces? The first one is the formation of a solid precipitate. If you look up here in the upper right-hand corner, here's an example of a solid precipitate. It could be white, it could be different Different color, but here's an example of that. If it forms water, right, if you mix two things and one of the things that it forms is water, then that is another driving force or a motive for a reaction to happen. If it creates or forms a gas or if it transfers its electrons, those are the different driving forces. So let me give you an example of that. I remember when I was younger and I was in the kitchen and I did kind of kitchen kitchen experiments. My mom gave me uh, baking soda and vinegar to do that classic uh, sciency volcano reaction. And so here's that reaction. Here's acetic acid, which is vinegar. And when you mix it with baking soda or sodium bicarbonate, you see bubbles start to form. And that reaction forms sodium acetate, water, and carbon dioxide. Now, of course, I didn't know that at the time. All I saw was really cool bubbling and fizzing. But this is an example of an experiment with driving forces. Notice that two of the products of this reaction, one of them is the formation of water. That's one driving force of this reaction. And the other thing that was formed was gas. We didn't start with water or gas to begin with, but those are two things that we ended up with as products. And those are what drive this reaction to happen. This is why you can mix baking soda and vinegar and have a reaction occur. Now, I was so fascinated with that reaction, I wanted to try mixing acetic acid or vinegar with other things. I remember reaching for the sugar and doing and putting it in a different cup with some baking with some vinegar and no reaction occurred. I was pretty disappointed by that. Well, I now know that when you mix vinegar and glucose and write the reaction that there's no driving force. There's nothing to drive this reaction. We don't get a formation of water. We don't get a formation of a gas. There's nothing forming a precipitate and there's no transfer of electrons. All I got was dissolved sugar. So in my second experiment, there's no driving force. Therefore, there's no reaction action that occurs. Now, one thing to watch out for, we've learned in chemistry one about evidences of chemical change. Don't confuse this list with the driving forces list, even though some of the things are the same. For driving forces, these are often the things that we predict in a written equation. Often it's good to write down an equation for a reaction and look for driving forces. If we don't see any driving forces, then we know that we probably don't even need to do the reaction because nothing's going to happen. Now, evidences of chemical change are typically things that you see after a reaction is happening. You're mixing things and you want to know if chemical changes taking place. These are the things that you see in a physical reaction. Um, some things are the same, like the formation of a precipitate. We can see that or predict that in writing. The emission of gas, right? We can see that or predict that in writing. But the other ones, they're not driving forces. They're just evidences of chemical change. All right, that leads us to the end of our notes. Let's take a moment to review and highlight key terms, ponder and ask questions, and then summarize what we've learned. Try to answer that essential question with some detail. Good luck.